episode 117, Assessments as Additional Income on the Social Workers Rise podcast. Hello and welcome to Social Workers Rise, where we inspire social workers to connect, expand their knowledge, and change more lives than they ever thought possible. We will talk everything social work on every level from micro to macro. We are going to hear stories of social workers who are doing big things, learn new skills, and most importantly, give you actionable steps to make a difference today. Let's go. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Social Workers Rise. It is your host, Catherine here. If you don't know me, I am a podcaster, a therapist, and also a mental health trainer and facilitator and career coach for social workers. So today I'm really excited because we're going to be talking with Tanisha Robinson. She is an LCSW out of the DC metro area who works full-time in medical social work and also part-time in her private practice doing supervision for interns, clinical supervisees, and also completing various evaluations, which we're going to talk about today. And I love this topic because it is a really, really great idea for anyone who wants to either add some extra cash to what they're already doing, or if you need to take a break, Maybe this can be a good part-time gig for you to just have that balance in life, right? So um, with that said, I do want to give you one reminder that if you do need a clinical supervisor, make sure to check out the RISE directory at risedirectory.com. If you are providing clinical supervision to social workers, be sure to claim your free profile on the directory We definitely need your services right now. So let's hop into this interview with Tanisha. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Social Workers Rise. I'm here with Tanisha Robinson. Welcome to the podcast, Tanisha. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me, especially on this really nice, unexpectedly nice weather for the day. Oh, good. Where are you at? Um, So I'm currently in my office um, in Fairfax. Um, So I work near Fair Oaks Mall. And so I'm hanging out in my office there. What state is that? Virginia. Sorry, Virginia. Virginia. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, because I'm in Southern California. So it's sunny. I'm like, oh, you know, another another day. (laughs) We normally have very traditional winters here, but today it's like in the 60s, which is kind of unheard of for February over here. All right. Bust out those shorts. <laughs> right. That's awesome. Well, tell us a little bit about you and what do you do? Um, so I'm a licensed clinical social worker and I have always been in medical and public health social work. That's pretty much been my area of expertise. It's what I studied when I was in my MSW program. And what I was able to kind of get into when I graduated was um, like crisis and trauma-focused medical and public health. So I was an ER and ICU social worker for a really long time working in those settings um, and then also have shifted into other areas of the hospital um, or of medical social work. Um, I currently work in uh, bariatric surgical and non-surgical programs, and I do um, psychiatric evaluations both to clear for surgery um, as well as follow-ups if it seems like someone needs a little extra support before they're able to continue. Um, So that's uh, what I do in terms of like full time. Um, A little about me, um, I am very obsessed with my cats. Um, I have two, their names are Ike and Maslow. And yes, for all of the social workers out there, that Maslow. Um, I like to draw and I am a comic book artist and illustrator and my dad and I actually do that together. We also um, obsess over Comic-Con and go to at least two every year. Fun. I love it. That's awesome. It sounds like a lot of different ways that you can self-care too, huh? Yes, very much so. 
Yeah, that's awesome. I love it. I love it. Um, so you mentioned how you do the immigration evaluations. And I would love to hear more about this because here on the Social Workers Rise podcast, I'm all about sharing how we can use our social work skills in new ways for ongoing impact mm -hmm. and income. So can you tell us, you know, what, what does this entail? What is it? Tell us. So an immigration clinical evaluation is there's two kinds. There's the psychological one, and then there is the medical piece. So oftentimes the medical piece is done by the physicians. And generally speaking, that is a very specific one to kind of look at like physical or medical ailments in reference to whatever specific visa they're applying for. When it comes to the psychological, uh, we are doing a clinical evaluation to see if their experiences that brought them to the U.S. and that are the reason that they've decided to come to the U.S. Um, are enough for them to be able to justify being being allowed to stay. Because oftentimes when people come seeking asylum, they're running from um, violence, some sort of political um, related persecution, um, sexual violence, a lot of the times LGBT depending on what part of the world we're looking at, isn't necessarily as widely accepted or even allowed. And so generally speaking, those people are in fear of their lives, their health, their wellness, their safety. And if they get sent back, you know, X things could happen. And so we look at the psychological piece that goes into the trauma they may have experienced, um, or if they have any ongoing psychiatric illnesses or psychiatric disorders that would be you know better managed here or would it be exacerbated should they be sent back and all in all we're looking out for that to see if that would from the lawyer's perspective be able to bolster their case for why they should be granted asylum or x visa to be allowed to stay our job is not to automatically side with them we are to do an unbiased clinical review and whether or not we think this review will help is what we you know we'll talk with the lawyers over but we're not necessarily like team client we are meant to just do the assessment and that's pretty much it okay so like an unbiased assessment that could be used for legal purposes yes so generally speaking um when you get a referral for one they give you a detailed kind of description of, you know, the person is in detention or not in detention. They are either comfortable with in-person video or, or both. And then they also talk about if you'll need to appear at the hearing in person or if just the report is needed. Now, most times just the report is fine and you're not needing to appear in, in court or in the hearing, but there are occasions where depending on the type of case or the information that they have, they would want that expert testimony to be there in person as well as in the written report. Um, I've only ever had to appear once when I was doing this. Um, and once I kind of understood the gravity of the case, I understood why they asked. But most of the time, my detailed report is just enough. Okay, nice. How was that experience going to court? So, Early on in my career, um, I did community mental health as well as community medical social work. And so I grew accustomed to having to appear in court because oftentimes people were coming for court ordered services. There was CPS or APS involved. They were in foster care. Um, and so a lot of the times the work that we do with that client or that patient was like a necessity to whatever the CPS, APS, et cetera, was trying to get done. So this isn't my first time ever appearing in court. I think the first time I ever had to go, I was very nervous because the stakes were different. Um, and there is a level where sometimes you do hope that, you know, whatever you're doing is helping someone, especially because I've heard such terrifying stories of, of things that people have experienced, gone through, um, had done to themselves or families, where it's like they are truly in danger. And if they go back home, like that's it. And so I had to, you know, eat, eat my Wheaties essentially that morning and kind of stay sharp. And once I got in there and I realized that this was not 
an episode of Law and Order, I was okay. But I think in my mind, I had it built up to like maybe some Oscar award nominated drama and it, it wasn't that bad, but it was a good and different experience because those are more so hearings than they are actual like court formal, like criminal charges. So it's a hearing. Um, it's usually just the, the lawyer present, the client, and then the judge, um, and then whatever evidence is being presented. Most of the people that um, I've done clinical uh, evaluations for are not being held on charges. I haven't had someone in detention, which those hearings would be very different, differently laid out. Okay. That makes sense. What would you say is the most challenging part of your work? Um, I'd say navigating, um, scheduling and having a translator. Um, so I speak, um, a few languages, but a lot of the times the folks that I am working with, um, so I, I'll give you an example. I speak Spanish, but sometimes the Spanish I speak, which I learned, uh, Caribbean and South American Spanish, a lot of the times the Central American Spanish dialect can be different. And so like sometimes words that I may say is different in whatever Central American country they're from versus where I learned my Spanish, which is South America. Um, so I always try to make sure specifically for these things that I have a, um, what is it? Um, a translator that's from that region because that translator would allow for me to understand like, hey, this is this word and they can translate that for me. Um, the other tricky part is when they're from more remote areas of the world, um, finding an appropriate translator if they don't speak English, that's probably been the hardest one because even with a language line, there's only but so many you know, dialects that may be available. And that's where it gets tough oftentimes. Right, definitely. What What would you do in those situations? So generally speaking, it's then on the lawyer to try and work on finding a translator for their client. And a lot of the times the lawyers aren't going to take on a client if they don't have a way to communicate with them. Um, so if the lawyer doesn't speak that language or isn't confident that they have someone that could translate in it, then they usually wouldn't take that case on. Um, we've gotten very lucky where a lot of the times the people who are from remote areas have lived in the U.S. long enough to speak English um, or they speak their dialect or their language within their village, plus um, what would be considered like a, a Western language. So like maybe they speak French or Spanish or something like that where they can understand that and we can get a translator for that versus the, just their specific dialect. Okay. That makes sense. And a really great example of a systematic barrier to accessing services, right? The, mm -hmm. the language and the, um, the availability of a translator. So um, really important to, to acknowledge there. Um, so, so, you know, in talking about that, would you say that it is a requirement to know different languages or do you feel like if we just know one language that we could still get by with a translator? Oh, absolutely. You can still get by. There are plenty of languages I do not speak. And every time, if I know I don't have that language or I'm not comfortable in doing this type of an assessment in that language, then I will ask the lawyer, you know, I'm happy to take this case on, but please ensure that you can provide a translator. Um, the only time that I then have to kind of be flexible is if the translator they have only works, you know, certain hours or certain days of the week. Um, I usually reserve these for um, like my weekends in the morning and I'll do like one in a day because it's usually several hours that I'm doing the assessment. And then, you know, I sit in front of my TV with my bo giant bottle of water and write the report up. Um, so I usually don't reserve that for a weekday because I work, you know, full time um, outside of that. So as long as there's that flexibility, um, then I usually can work with it. There's been a rare occasion where like a translator only works weekdays and then I just, you know, I adjust, but nine times out of 10, you can work it with any of these. And usually you're asking the lawyers, hey, can you all provide a translator? Or do you have a language line that can accommodate this? Because I do not. 
Interesting. So mm-hmm. is this an option for a side hustle? Because it sounds like it's essentially doing maybe like a biopsychosocial assessment. What do you what do you think about that? Hey, it's Catherine here. I hope you are enjoying this episode. We're going to take a quick break to listen to these ads from our sponsors. Do you want to make your own podcast? Spotify has a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere and even earn money all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters. And this is the platform that I use because it makes it so simple to record and distribute your podcast all in one place using your cell phone. What you need to do is download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com backslash podcasters to get started. If you're planning to take the BBS Law and Ethics exam, the ASWB Master's or Clinical Licensure exam, or if you're studying for the MFT exam, then you need a proven program that can help you understand the exam questions and pass with confidence. If this is you, I highly recommend the Therapist Development Center. I personally use TDC to pass my law and ethics and clinical exams and found the program provided me with everything I needed to pass with confidence. TDC's program integrates various ways of learning in an organized fashion, containing all of the information you need to pass without the overwhelm. And now bonus, TDC is also offering a library of continuing education courses that fulfill your license renewal requirements and will support you in your career development. If this sounds like something that you need, visit their website, therapistdevelopmentcenter.com and use the code SWRISE10 at checkout to receive 10% off any of their CE courses, including their brand new course, On the Edge of Life, an introduction to suicidality. You can also check out the link in the show notes. So it is a side hustle. Um, I would suggest that you do a training because there is so much more to it um, that goes into it, being able to understand the specific ways to ask the questions from a legal perspective, because we're not clinically diagnosing anyone. Um, So like no one's coming to me and then being like, okay, let's start services. I am doing a clinical evaluation to, to review if there are those psychological symptoms that, you know, could either be exacerbated or were caused by the reason they came to the U.S. in the first place. So the other good thing is it's, you're not making clinical recommendations. And so if you're not working in a clinical setting and you have this as like a side hustle and your full-time job's not in that, that's okay. This still helps you to flex those clinical muscles without then having to jump into treatment with somebody. Right. That makes sense. And um, we talked a little bit offline how um, it's really just kind of a one shot or maybe two visits um, doing the assessment. So it's much different than having ongoing clients. You're more mm-hmm. of just able to provide them with the one time assessment, like, okay, you know, on your way, <laughs> generally right. speaking. Is that usually how it is? Yes. Um, so depending on the case, I usually schedule either one really long visit or I schedule it as two shorter visits. It depends after talking to the lawyer, what I, what we think they can tolerate. Um, There are some people that just have such debilitating health or even mental health, you know, symptoms or conditions where doing, you know, a two hour long visit or three hours, depending on the need can be very hard on them. And so then we would break it up into chunks and I'd say, we're going to do one this day and then we're the other half this day, and then I'm able to kind of write the report. It helps when the lawyers are able to provide you with so much information in advance, because then a lot of the times when you're reviewing it, you'll ask them to, you know, report their story to you. What brought them here? What's happened? What was that traumatic event? And then some of the other things similar to what you would do at a biopsychosocial is you can kind of, um, confirm the information. So like if they have all these doctor's notes and and whatnot, I can confirm, do you have high blood pressure? 
do you have this? Do you have that? Where? And then that's easier than me saying, what is X, Y, or Z? Tell me all of your medical. I already have that. It's documented. It's signed off by Dr. So-and-so, clinic so-and-so. And I can incorporate that information into my, um, my report sooner, which also then cuts down on time after the assessment that I have to spend writing it because I can incorporate that stuff earlier. Right. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. What would you say is the fa- your the your most favorite <laughs> part or the best part about um you know about what you do? So the I'll I'll, I'll give an immediate and then like a long term one. Um, the immediate one is this is probably um, some of the work that I have done where I do feel like I may have helped this person. A lot of them are very thankful. Um, I do a mix of um, sliding scale and then like free evals. There are absolutely people who can afford to pay and I do have those clients. Um, But I'm also, I have a full-time job. Like I I am blessed enough where my full-time job, I make a good salary. And so like this truly is a side hustle. And it's also something that I want to do because I know People, you know, it shouldn't be a stressor that you may be sent back to a country that, you know, you're experiencing this type of abuse, neglect or fear of your life because you couldn't afford to get the evaluation done. So I do um, pro bono assessments as well. And a lot of the times, no matter whether someone paid or has it as a pro bono assessment, there's so there's so much gratitude that comes from that. And, you know, we as social workers know we. We work in a field where we're not always going to get those thank yous. We know that you're thankful deep down, but we're not always going to hear those. And so I think that's sometimes the instant um, like gratification that I hear. The long term is when you've done an assessment, you've submitted it, you know, you don't know exactly when their hearing is or how far in advance. Um, but then maybe they, the client or even the lawyer reaches back out with a thank you from the client because they were able to be granted whatever visa they were applying for or asylum. Um, And even though I know it's a team effort and it's not just like my assessment didn't tip the scales necessarily, it's still nice to know I was a part of something that was so much bigger, you know, than myself. Right. Definitely. Yes. That's amazing. So how much is the standard rate, you know, anywhere from pro, pro bono? What would be, you know, the top end of these assessments that we would expect to um, to get paid? So generally, the going rate is anywhere from um, eight to twelve hundred dollars. Um, my assessments and and when I the training that I did, um, the understanding and the knowledge that we have, as well as the very in-depth amount of time that we're spending reviewing documents in advance, you know, conversating with the lawyers, then the actual clinical evaluation, and then the report write-up, it adds up when you think about the amount of time. And so um, generally 800 is on the lower end, depending on how new you are to it. 1200 is on the higher end, where I've seen for a lot of people that have a lot of experience. Um, I also offer a sliding scale, again, for the folks who, you know, maybe can't afford my actual rate. I do a sliding scale. I offer payment plans. Um, Again, I I believe mental health in general, no one should go broke trying to get access to that. Um, But there there are some higher end prices that I have seen. Um, I pride myself in making sure that my report is very comprehensive um, and that I give a timeline that is appropriate to the lawyer, especially if they say, hey, I need it by this day and time. If I'm not able to do that, I'll give them a realistic time. And if they're able to adjust, great. If not, then I'll say, you know, that's the best I can do. So that it also helps with being realistic with them trusting you and getting those referrals. Sometimes it's... Um, better to have a slightly lower price in the beginning, I will say, and build a rapport and a network with the lawyers that, you know, can appreciate what you do and get more referrals than have a higher price and maybe just get a few because not a lot of people can afford whatever your rate is. So I I judge it based off of a couple different things. And I partner with an organization that 
um, lawyers will submit to to get pro bono assessments. And that's where I get the pro bono assessments from. And then everyone else is either sliding scale or the full rate. Okay. Interesting. That's great. So um, it sounds like networking is really important and, um, and just having like a entry level rate to Mm -hmm. get your feet wet and to get your name out there and Mm -hmm. get people um, exposed to the quality of your work would be really helpful. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering for someone who has never done this before, maybe they have some sort of experience in assessment, um, but that's it. How do they get started in this type of work? Is there a specific training? You know, you mentioned doing a training um, Mm -hmm. before, like where would people go to find that? And then also too, is this something that we're going to be doing individually? Like, are we marketing on our own or do we join some sort of directory or organization that would, um, that would send us business? So there are, there are several trainings that exist out there. Um, the one that I did was with Georgia King. Um, I found hers to be a bigger support network. Um, the training that she does is two days. Um, I don't, remember that it's, I don't think it's eight hours each day. I think it's maybe like four, four hours each day. And you have the option to do either the live training or there's a pre-recorded one where you can do it on your own time. Once you've signed up, um, I chose to do the pre-recorded one just because it was easier with all the obligations I had that I could do it around that. Um, once I was done, I an- answered the eval, got my CEUs, which is great. It's all also a big chunk of CEUs. And then she also offers a Facebook group. She just created and launched the directory. um, And she has monthly uh, group calls where people can kind of work with each other and ask questions, get help. Um, The Facebook group is a great place to ask questions and have others give feedback or even make referrals. Hey, I have you know, this U visa assessment that needs to be done in X state and I can't take them things like that. Um, The other place that I would say is PHR and PHR, you would do the training essentially with Georgia or whatever other organization. Um, And then PHR is called Physicians for Human Rights. So that was the organization I've mentioned before. They initially started out just doing the medical portion of things where they would do the medical evals for people who are applying for some of those other visas or asylum. They added in the psychiatric component and they have a, an additional training for how to kind of work with some of their clients. And then once you're done with that, you get into their network and directory and they send out multiple, um, multiple cases that are needed. They'll give you a short summary. PHR will help support you if you're having, you know, issues connecting to the lawyer. Um, But that's also how I've networked with lawyers. Um, I did a couple of those reports and I let them know like, hey, if you do have any other clients that have a need, you know, um, please feel free to reach out. These are the evals I do. And that's how I've also gotten referrals for paying clients in addition to the one that I did because they were so impressed with the report that I did or the way I handled things things like that. So it is pretty easy to kind of get out there. Um, I do suggest people do PHR because again, that is a great way to just get connected to lawyers in in your area and they are also making money. So it's not like every case that they'll ever send you is going to be a pro bono one. They understand that at the end of the day, everyone is still doing a business. So that's another way to get connected, show them what you can do, build up kind of also your own resume of saying, I've done this many reports for these things, especially because sometimes lawyers want an example. Um, So I have one that I've done where I redact everything name wise and personal information wise. And then I say, this is one I can show you um, as an example of my work. And that also helps. They also give tips on ways that you can market, whether it be, you know, kind of email blasting out to lawyers in in the states that you're um, licensed in or putting it up on your website, your Facebook, social media, things like that. So there's a mix of of supports and how to market. But I would definitely say um, Georgia King's training really helped me and they have the directory as well. And then joining Physicians for Human Rights has helped to link and network me with different lawyers and law firms. Okay, great. And Mm -hmm. um, 
Two last questions. One mm-hmm. is how long do these assessments usually take? Like how, how many hours are you usually spending with one client? So I'd say probably two to three hours. Um, and that's why breaking it up into chunks, you can either do like one hour one day or an hour and a half one day and an hour and a half another day. Um, I've been lucky where I have been able to just knock it all out in one day. Um, a lot of the times the clients that I have done these assessments for have a lot of um, medical conditions. Um, and so they tend to go to a lot of different doctor's appointments. Um, and so for them trying to navigate breaking it up into chunks is a little bit harder unless they're doing it as a virtual one. But for the ones that come in, I haven't had any issues with getting it knocked out in one day. It also has helped because they've had so much information given to me in advance by the the lawyers and the law firms that I've worked with. So I don't have to worry too heavily about that. Okay. And then how long does the documentation take you? Okay, so if I cut out the pure entertainment known as Parks and Rec that I have on in the background, I'd probably say it takes me anywhere from like, if I just sat and like dedicated myself, probably another two hours, give or take. Um, What I tell everybody when I'm doing is I have my list of all of my questions and I type in just general bullet points as I go. And then when I get home, I'm finessing it. So I do concurrent documentation because I don't want to write it down on a, on a notepad and then have to type everything out by hand. The only time I've ever done that was when I like, we lost power. There was a big storm and we lost power, didn't have internet. Um, and my laptop did eventually die. So I had to write it down by hand. Um, but otherwise I have my template pulled up and I just do concurrent documentation where I ask the question, type the little bullet points for the answers, and then I go home and I flesh it out as full comprehensive paragraphs. Right, yeah, that makes a lot of sense and um, some time-saving tips too. Um, mm-hmm. And my last question is, do we have to be licensed? Do we have to have a clinical license to do this? Or do you think that this is the type of work that we could do with um, some training and maybe like a BSW or an MSW? So from my understanding, when I took the training, they, it is preferred that you are clinically licensed um, because of the nature of what you're doing and that you're handing this in as a, as a, legal, a clinically legal document, um, the same way that the doctors all have to be licensed. They're wanting us to also be clinically licensed. I will say if a clinical supervisee takes the course or like a, a resident um, takes the training course, um, and they're doing it, my suggestion would be that they're whoever is clinically supervising them, or if they have an external clinical supervisor, whoever the administrative supervisor is, be trained and be able to sign off on that report. If they are not trained and they can't sign off on that report, I would just say no. Um, like I clinically supervise um, several social workers working towards their LCSW. If they were to go and get the training and then they wanted to go over it, absolutely. But, you know, I would be the one signing off as the clinically, you know, supervising LCSW. And I have had the training and do this. But outside of that, if you're a BSW, I would say that would potentially be more of like a scribe so that the clinician can ask the questions and maybe like the BSW would be able to kind of document for them. And then they just take those notes and you know, flesh it out later. But outside of that, I would definitely say being clinically licensed or working towards clinical licensure with a supervisor that is trained is going to be your best options. Okay. Awesome. Well, hey, you know, five hours of work for $800 does not sound too shabby to me. (laughs) Right. Exactly. So it could be an area um, for some people, you know, definitely worth looking into, especially if you are the type of person who really just wants to do the assessments and short term, um, short term type of work, then Mm -hmm. it could be a really, really good option for you. Thank you so, so much, Tanisha, for your time. Where can people find you and connect with you? Um, So. My practice has um, a website. It's www.imaniholisticcounseling.com. That's Imani spelled I as in igloo, M as in Mary, A-N-I, holisticcounseling.com. We have Facebook. We have Instagram. 
um, all of those places someone could connect with me on. There's a form on the website. So if you're looking to reach out to connect about something that you heard here or in general, you know, fill out that form. It'll come to our, our practice and I'll be able to respond. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, listener, if you enjoyed this episode or if you know someone who might be interested in learning more about immigration evaluations as a job or as a side hustle or whatever it might be, go ahead and send this episode to them and make sure that you're also subscribed to the Social Workers Rise podcast. Thank you so much, Tanisha. Thank you for having me and for all the time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Bye. Bye. If you're interested in pursuing this as an additional side hustle, but you're feeling like your documentation skills and your assessment skills aren't quite there yet, then I highly encourage you to look at the course that I've created, The Clinical Essentials for the Future Therapist. This course will help you really hone in on your assessment skills, your documentation skills, so that you can confidently show up and talk to lawyers and say, yes, I can definitely do these assessments. So if that is something that you're interested in, sign up for the email list and you will automatically get information about that course, the Clinical Essentials for the Future Therapist. It is a game changer. Thank you for listening to another episode of Social Workers Rise. If you love this episode, be sure to subscribe and text this episode to a friend. If you want more, there are a few ways we can get to know each other and work together. First, definitely subscribe to the Friday resource email list. The link is in the show notes. And that's where you can learn more about the courses I offer, including clinical essentials for the future therapist and the Pulse basics for medical social workers. I'll also be sending out occasional tips and resources and other happenings within the social work industry. And for all your clinical supervision needs, be sure to visit risedirectory.com. This is a national directory of clinical supervisors for social workers, and we also provide free resources that you can use within your own clinical supervision. Lastly, if you have more individualized needs, I do offer coaching individual consultations, and am available for public speaking engagements for social workers and change makers. Lastly, the boring legal stuff, but very important. The information in this podcast is not meant to be a supplement for therapy, professional advice, or clinical supervision. This content is provided as is solely for informational purposes. It is not legal health or safety advice. I am not advising you as a therapist. Organizations should engage their own experts to ensure any adoptive measures are compliant with applicable laws and standards in their jurisdictions. The opinions expressed by individuals or organizations are their own and do not reflect the views or opinions of Social Workers Rise or Catherine Moore. References to specific products or organizations do not constitute any endorsement or recommendations by Social Workers Rise.